Hey guys, in this video I'd like to talk about quantum numbers. So these are usually very confusing, but I hope to draw an analogy in this video that actually makes them understandable. So quantum numbers are like an electron's address. They tell you where an electron is located. So I sketched what roughly an atom looks like right here. You've got a central nucleus with a bunch of surrounding tiny electrons that are orbiting in clouds. And I just want you to understand that each electron has a specific unique set of quantum numbers that tell you roughly where it's located. So this electron's quantum numbers are going to be different than this electron's quantum numbers. It's like the electron's unique address. So the way quantum numbers work is that there are four of them. And as you go on, they get more specific. They start out general and they get very specific. And this is just like your address, right? It starts off general and then gets more specific. So it's like it starts off with maybe you live in Texas, then maybe your city is Austin, then you live on Elm Street and you live in house number 37. So it becomes progressively more specific, unique and informative as you get more information. And that's just how this works. So the most general thing you can know about an electron's location is its energy level or its shell number. And we denote this with the letter N. This is like knowing the electron's state. You know, what state does the electron live in? So these numbers go from one, two, three, four, and so on. They're just whole number integers starting at one, going up as high as you can. Um, so we, we would pick a, an energy level or a shell number for a specific electron. And then using that, we would get its azimuthal number. And that's denoted with the letter L. This is like knowing the electron's city, right? So if we just know an electron's state, well, tons of electrons are gonna live in the same state, right? Millions of people live in Texas. But if we go to Austin, there's less people than in all of Texas, right? It's more specific. So the azimuthal number goes up to from zero to N minus one. So let's say N was three. There was an electron and it had uh, the energy level three. So that means the azimuthal number could either be zero, one, or two, right? Because three minus one is two. Okay, then we have the magnetic number or M sub L. This is like knowing the electron's street number. So we're getting even more specific now. And the way we get the magnetic number is we pick one from negative L to positive L. So notice how if N was three, and I've written the example over here, if N was three, we found that L could be zero, one, or two. We actually have to pick an L to get our M sub L because each L is like, these are three different possible cities that the electron could live in. And we need to pick one so that we can get possible street numbers now. So let's say we picked city two or L of two. Uh, well, just so you know, that actually means that we're at a D orbital. So there are five D orbitals. So that's why the magnetic number goes from negative L to positive L. So if we pick two, we're gonna go from negative two to positive two. So negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. So you can see how when L is two, we're at a D orbital, and now these all represent the different D orbitals. There are five of them. So now from there, we pick a spin number. This is like knowing the electron's house number. It's only gonna be for one specific electron now. So if we, for example, pick, we can either pick positive one half or negative one half. Let's just say we pick positive one half. Now we have a specific electron address and only one electron will fit that address. Just like only one person can have your address. You know, assuming that one person lives in each house, of course. So notice how in order to get the next number, the more specific parts of the address, you have to have the previous number. So for example, when we picked three, we knew the azimuthal number could either be zero, one, or two. And then from the azimuthal number, we had to pick one of these numbers. So we, we ended up just picking two, just for example's sake. And we knew that L equals two means we have a D orbital. So there are five D orbitals and that's why we had negative one, I'm sorry, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, five M sub L's. M sub L's are sort of like, they tell you the number of orbitals that you have. And I wanna explain that a little bit further. So let's say, for example, instead of picking two, we picked a one. So now M sub L 
is only going to go from negative 1 to positive 1. So it'll be negative 1, 0, and 1. And that makes sense, right? Because L of 1 means we're at a p orbital, and there are three p orbitals. And let me explain why that's the case. So a p orbital looks like this. It looks kind of like a dumbbell or like an infinity symbol. And you can imagine that atoms are in three-dimensional space, right? So these clouds can either be on the x-axis, on the y-axis, or going in and out of the board on the z-axis. There are three different ways to orient a p orbital, and that's why there are three of them. If we were to pick zero here, for our L, that means our M sub L would only be zero, right? You can't have a negative zero and a positive zero. So if we pick zero, M sub L would be zero. And that means we're at an S orbital. And there's only one S orbital. And that makes sense because an S orbital is just a sphere. You can't orient a sphere in two different ways, right? You just, you have one way to put a sphere down. You can't have a sphere on the X axis and then on the Y axis or on the Z axis. It's all the same. It's not like a dumbbell where you can rotate it and make it look different, right? So I hope this makes some sense. Um, you should at least have this memorized. Other important things to know is that each orbital can hold two electrons. So for example, this s orbital here can hold two electrons, while each p orbital can hold two electrons. But if there are three p orbitals, guess how many all three can hold? Six, right? And there's an important trick that you should know. It's the number of electrons in an atom is equal to 2n squared. So if I know n is equal to 3, that means the total number of electrons in an atom are going to be equal to 2 times n squared, and n is 3, so 2 times 9, or 18. So if you just tell me that we have an n of 3, I can tell you we have 18 total electrons in that atom. Okay, now I'd like to run through some examples. So I'm asking which of the following sets of quantum numbers are possible? So think about what this means. As an analogy, these are all electron addresses. So when an address is impossible, it's sort of like saying, well, if I know someone lives in California, it's impossible that they could live in Boston, right? So that's what I mean by an impossible set of quantum numbers. So the first one here, n equals two. So we know n equals two, so then they're saying L equals one. Well, is that okay? Can L equal one? Well, if N equals two, then we know L can be anything from zero to N minus one. So zero or one, right? And L is one, so that's fine. And then what about M sub L? Well, M sub L is negative L to positive L. So L is one, so the M sub L has to either be negative one, zero, or one. And it is, right? It's zero, so that checks out. And then m sub s we know just has to be positive or negative one half. So everything checks out. This is a possible set of quantum numbers. Okay, the second one, n equals three. So can l equal three? So n equals three, so that means l equals zero to n minus one, or zero, one, or two. So l can't equal three, right? So that, we don't even have to look at the rest of it. We know that that is not a possible set of quantum numbers. Okay, the third one n equals 4, so can L equal 3? Well, if n equals 4, we know L can be 0, 1, 2, or 3. So that checks out, that can be 3. But if L is 3, can M sub L equal 4? Well, look at M sub L. It's negative L to positive L. So if L is 3, M sub L is either negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, or 3. Can't have 4, right? So this is also not allowed. This is a not a possible set of quantum numbers. Okay, what about this one? n equals 3. So can L equal 2? Yep, that's n minus 1, and that's one of the allowed azimuthal numbers. Can m sub L equal negative 2? Well, we know m sub L is negative L to positive L, and negative 2 is negative L, so yep, that works. And then M sub S, just positive one half, which is one of the allowed numbers, so this one's fine. Okay, this one, N equals one, so can L equals zero? Yep, because it's just zero up to N minus one, and we know zero is one minus one, so that's fine. M sub L, can that be zero? 
Well, yeah, it actually has to be zero because if L is zero, that means the M sub L is just negative zero to positive zero, which is just zero. And then M sub S, well, we know that is either gotta be plus one half or minus one half, and it's minus one half, so that works. And then the last one, n equals zero. So actually n cannot equal zero. It has to start at one. So without even looking at the rest of this, I know this is not a possible set of quantum numbers. Okay, I'd like to finish this video up with this last set of problems here. So I'm asking how many electrons share the following quantum numbers within an atom? So this is sort of like asking how many people share this same part of their address? It's like saying, okay, if I just put Texas down, well, millions of people are gonna share that. But if I put Texas, Austin, Elm Street. Well, maybe 40 people would share that, right? Maybe 40 people live on Elm Street. So that's the analogy here. So how many electrons share the quantum number n equals four? That's all we're given, right? All we know is n equals four. We don't know any of the other three quantum numbers. Well, we can actually use this trick here. Number of electrons in an atom is equal to two n squared. So we know that the number of electrons in an atom with n equals four is equal to two n squared, right? n is four, so two times four squared is two times 16, which is equal to 32. So it's possible that 32 electrons in a given atom share n equals four, right? So n equals one, we can use the same strategy. So two n squared, so two times one squared is equal to two times one, which is equal to two. So only two electrons within a given atom share the level n equals one, the energy level n equals one. Okay, moving on, n equals two, and then we're also given the additional uh, quantum number L equals one. So think about this. We know if L equals one, we're at a p orbital, right? And there are three p orbitals, each one contains two electrons. So if there are three p orbitals, each containing two electrons, that means that this has six possible residents in it, right? You can think about the electrons as like residents of that address. And you can also think about this another way. So if L equals one, then we know M sub L is either negative one, zero, or positive one. So if M sub L is equal negative one, is either negative one, zero, or positive one. And then we know each one of those M sub L's could have a positive or negative one half spin. They could either go off to have a negative one half or a positive one half spin. That's one, two, three, four, five, six total possibilities. So you get the same answer. Okay, on to the next one. So N equals one and L equals zero. So L equals zero implies we're at an S orbital where there is only one orbital, right? It's just a sphere. We can only orient it one way in 3D space. So there can only be two electrons that match this beginning of their address, right? And you could also think about that like the way we, we thought about it last time. So if L equals zero, we know M sub L can only equal zero. So if it can only equal zero, then this can only go off to have a positive or negative spin, so two options, so the answer there is two. Okay, moving on to n equals four, l equals three, and m sub l equals negative three. So remember, m sub l is like picking the orbital. We're picking one of the orbitals. Since l was equal to three, we know we're in an f orbital, so there are actually seven of those, but we picked one of them. So within each orbital, we know there can only be two electrons. So think about it like this. If we know our M sub L is negative three, we, all we can do is assign it either a positive or a negative spin. So there are two possible branch points from there for an electron to choose from a different address. Okay, then finally this last one, we have a complete address. And we know when we have all four quantum numbers, we know only one electron can possibly live there. So the possible electrons with this uh, quantum number set in a given atom is only one. So I really hope this video helped you guys out. Uh, if you have any questions or you're interested in tutoring, please contact me at facebook.com slash de novo tutoring, and I'll, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks a lot.